join me in welcoming Tyler Gutschenritter. Can everyone hear me all right? You good? All right, so if we can get my slide. All right, so throughout my internship, I was surrounded by newspaper magazine articles that look just like the ones you see up here, articles with which I'm sure many of you have also read. And these articles all set out to answer the same questions. What are we facing? In essence, what is cancer? Cancer is a word which encompasses over 100 distinctly different diseases, one which evokes a level of fear and anxiety surpassed by few other words in our language. It is a disease whose conquerors are hailed as survivors, whose afflicted are entrenched in a fight for their life, and whose vanquished are memorialized as having lost their battle. To put it simply, there is no other disease that is quite like cancer. And as a, as a society, we have waged a war on cancer, and for good reason. But in doing so, we have taken a disease, and we have brought it to life. We have given cancer a story of its own. Cancer is actually a very ancient disease, one which is intrinsic to the human condition. The earliest documented cases of cancer can actually be traced back to Egyptian texts from 2500 BC. These texts discuss a tumor of the breast for which there was sadly no treatment. And despite being given a face, this disease did not have a name until two centuries later. It was in 400 BC that Hippocrates used the Greek word carcinos, meaning crab, to describe these tumors clutched by swollen and stretched vessels, tumors which he thought resembled crabs with their legs spread and dug firmly into the sand. And while this disease continued to plague our society for the centuries following its christening, it wasn't until, or sorry, the word cancer was not spoken above a whisper until the signing of the National Cancer Act by President Nixon in 1971. It was with this ceremonial signing that the war on cancer was formally declared and the quest for a cure had begun. And so this brings us to today, 42 years following the inception of this war, and we are still faced with the same questions. What are we up against? How far have we truly come in this battle? And unfortunately, the answers are still very dismal. One in two men and one in three women will be diagnosed with cancer during their lifetime. And even more sobering is the fact that in this year alone, 600,000 Americans will die of cancer. That is equivalent to a fourth or a quarter of all American deaths. And while cancer currently stands as the second leading cause of death in America, it is on pace to surpass heart disease as a leading death or cause of death within this decade. And so in an effort to combat this epidemic, the National Cancer Institute will spend $5 billion on cancer research and treatment in this year alone. And while this might seem like an adequate amount of funding, what I want you to consider is that in the past 10 years, America has spent 20 times as much on wars with other countries, and in that same 10-year period, cancer has claimed 1,000 times as many lives. And so given these numbers, it's easy to see how enveloped our lives have truly come by this disease and how important it is to continue to battle for, how important it is to continue our battle against this formidable opponent. Okay, there we go. And that brings us to the topic of cancer research, my role in the war on cancer. Over the past year, I've been fortunate enough to work with the amazing physicians at Cancer Treatment Centers of America. We have worked together to develop new treatment guidelines for the use of deep tissue hyperthermia in conjunction with radiation therapy. And while deep tissue hyperthermia might sound a little scary, it actually utilizes the same microwave technology all of us have come to know and love. However, instead of heating up last night's dinner or an old bag of popcorn, these microwave rays are actually being used to heat up solid tumors in an effort to increase the effectiveness of subsequent radiation therapy. And the ultimate project of this goal is to provide a novel therapeutic option for patients who are fighting recurrent pelvic cancer, a disease which is notoriously difficult to treat with standard treatment options. And while being surrounded by such amazing physicians and such amazing technology during my internship has inf influenced me and inspired me to pursue a career in medicine, the most, I would say, the most transformative experiences have come from Cancer Treatment Center of America's unique environment that offers both physical and spiritual healing, one that centers on the patient, an environment that has given me a model for how I hope to one day practice medicine. And see, through my internship, I've discovered that the best physicians are not those who simply prescribe the most medications. They're not those who simply perform the most scans. They're the physicians who develop sincere relationships with their patients. They're the physicians that deliver compassionate and comprehensive care. And it is this relationship that is between the physician and the patient that I believe is at the heart of medicine. It is a bond that has existed long before our era of technology. 
It is one that dates back to a time when a physician's hands were the primary diagnostic tools. It is a bond that centers on the intimate ritual involving the disrobing, the examining of the patient, the divulging of secrets that most patients probably wouldn't even feel comfortable telling their closest family members. And through my internship, I've had the experience of witnessing this powerful ritual. And I've come to understand why it still remains so vital to the practice of medicine today. And that is because it, sig er, uh, yeah, and that is because it signals a transformation. It provides hope for the patient because with every ritual, there is a promise. Take, for example, the rituals of marriage. Accompanied by a sacred vow, it signals a transformation from a life of solitude to one of companionship and bliss. Or the ritual of a president being sworn into office, which signals the transformation to a position of power and is accompanied by an oath to protect and preserve the freedom we cherish so dearly. And it's through my internship that I've come to understand that the ritual between the physician and the patient also signals a transformation. A transformation that marks a patient's journey from sickness to health. And it too is accompanied by a promise. It is a promise that I believe is perfectly displayed in this painting by Francisco Goya entitled My Self Portrait with Dr. Arietta. Stricken by an illness that has left him deaf, delirious, and partially blind, Goya can be seen clutching his sheets near death being tended to by Dr. Arietta. The shadowy figures surrounding Goya are his, clergy, er, are his servants and local clergy who kept vigil as Goya was expected to die at any moment. However, against all odds, through the compassionate and abiding care of Dr. Arietta, Goya made a full recovery and went on to live eight more years. And upon his recovery, he painted this in an expression of gratitude for Dr. Arietta's care. And for me, encapsulated in this painting is the promise I watched physicians make every day throughout my internship. And it is the promise I too have been inspired to make as during my time in my internship that I hope to make to my patients one day as an oncologist. And it is the unwavering and it is the sacred bond between two indelibly connected souls, the physician and the patient, it is the promise which says, I will never abandon you. You will never be alone in your fight. I will be with you through the end. And so with what little time I've left, I would like to thank OCAST and everyone who has made my internship possible. It was not only an informative experience, but a transformative one as well. And it is an experience I'll be forever grateful. Thank you.